Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Veronica Hutchison, and I'm the Managing Symposium Editor for the Journal of Law Reform here at Michigan Law. And today we are having our panel on reform discussions for our annual symposium this year titled Reimagining uh, Police Surveillance and Protecting Activism and Ending Technologies of Oppression. Um, today, we have a wonderful moderator who we're so excited about joining us, uh, Phil Mayer. He's uh, here from the ACLU of Michigan, and he's done a ton of work on policing in the Detroit community, um, and we're just really excited to have him here to discuss this really important topic. So with that, I'll let Bill take it away. Thanks, Veronica. It's really an honor to be asked to, to moderate uh, a, a panel uh, like this, and uh, this, this symposium has been great all week and really just filled with all-stars, and, uh, and, and this, this panel is no exception. Um, we have with us here today four of the uh, leading thinkers on reforming uh, surveillance in the police state uh, in, in, in the country, uh, I dare say in the world, um, <clears throat> in, in alphabetical order by last name. Uh, Bennett Capers uh, is a professor at the University of Fordham Law School, where he's the director of their Center of Race, Law, and Justice. Uh, and uh, he has many honors, but the one that uh, most impresses me as a former law student is that he's the three-time teacher of the year uh, there, <clears throat> um, which I think is a great uh, asset to have on, on any panel where we're all trying to understand the future of surveillance. Um, <clears throat> uh, Andrew Ferguson is professor of law at American University, uh, and, where he is an expert on predictive policing uh, and has literally written not just a book, but books on, on the subject, as well as countless law journal articles, um, including a, an important uh, forthcoming one that I, I know he'll be talking about. Um, Hamid Khan is an organizer at Stop LAPD Spying Coalition in Los Angeles and the former executive director of South Asian Networking. Uh, and it's great to have an advocate as well as uh, an academic, as well as academics and, and uh, uh, and litigators on the panel. Uh, and finally, Jumana Musa is, uh, the, uh, is with the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers where she is the director of their Fourth Amendment Center. Uh, they, I recently had the privilege of attending trainings uh, that, that she has organized um, and, and result of recent reports they've put out about predictive policing, big data and surveillance. Um, really, these are the experts and I, I'm gonna start the panel by, uh, by asking each person to take about five minutes to just address what, uh, what reforming police surveillance technologies uh, looks like to you. Um, talk about how your work, whether academic or practical, uh, has, has examined and challenged what it means to reform um, and, and what, it mean, like what the path forward is uh, around surveillance in, in your perspective. So I have uh, the honor of going first and first thank you to the journal and for all of you uh, attending out there. The reform idea I wanna talk to you about today comes from an article I'm working on called The Tyrant Test. In fact, it's called Surveillance and the Tyrant's Test it will be published this month. Um, but before I get to my sort of solution for reform, I wanna talk a bit about where we've been and where we're going. Surveillance and policing and technologies of oppression have been around since policing. Um, but the growth of this big data surveillance technology is really only about 12 years old. I almost put it around 20, uh, you know, 2010. We really saw what I call the rise of big data policing. That doesn't mean there haven't been technologies of oppression and policing all the way through, because there have. But this immediate growth, this interest, and this new form of big data surveillance is a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, and as we have sort of approached these reform moments, we've seen different types of approaches. I want to call them what I call the trust lens. We've seen this idea, like, let's just trust the police, which has worked out terribly. Uh, we've then seen this idea of, well, it's all a trap. And we'll talk a bit about what I call uh, the trap lens, which is a quasi-abolitionist uh, vision, but I'm not going to step on uh, Hamid uh, Khan's toes, who is the leading figure on abolition in this uh, uh, panel. Uh, and then I want to talk about the technocratic lens and the limits there, and then talk to you just a bit about what I call my tyrant test. So first, just give you a background of the trust lens. The trust lens is the dominant uh, way we approach police technologies uh, today. And it is essentially this idea that we should just trust police. Um, it's an idea of reform that's internal reform. There's really no reform at all. Uh, and for the most of the last decade, that's really what we've been, what we've been doing. And for the most of the last decades, every week, almost every week, 
there's been a scandal about police technologies. Either police have inadvertently or very intentionally or mistakenly or somehow messed up the technology. Literally every single week, there's been a scandal because police have abused these technologies. Um, we have recognized that the surveillance is racist. It's reifying racial bias in policing. We realize it is discriminatory and that it targets poor and uh, protects private property. Uh, and really it hasn't made anyone safer. And yet, even though this trust lens has failed, it's still the dominant uh, way most cities, even progressive cities like San Francisco and Oakland are approaching these kinds of technology. It's a reform without a reform and it really hasn't worked. The same kind of lens that we've seen is what I call the trap lens. And again, it's informed by an abolitionist movement, but I'm not gonna speak too much about it because I know uh, Hamad Khan, who is literally the leading national figure on this, uh, has much more and much more legitimacy to talk about it. But I frame it as a trap lens because it is showing that all police surveillance is a trap. Why is it a trap? Because no matter how it is pitched for public safety or some other good, it's gonna spring and capture black and brown people the poor, the powerless, and those who stand in the way of capitalism and privilege. And how do we know it's a trap? Well, the history of America shows it's a trap. It's never been a moment in time where it hasn't caught those same people and been used to uh, oppress those same people. And the problem is the police. Um, and police technologies are only going to exacerbate that police power. You take one bad thing and add another bad thing, you're not going to get a good thing. It's going to still be uh, a bad thing. Um, and there are criticisms, concerns that we can talk about in terms of what the abolitionist trap lens does, but it's clearly a way of thinking about reform. That is simply to abolish police and abolish police surveillance technologies. Um, but I'll let uh, Hamid uh, uh, talk about there. The third approach has been what I call the technocratic lens. And the technocratic lens tends or seeks to reform police surveillance by adding in legislative authorization, policies, audits, rulemakings, and other forms of sort of top-down and expert oversight. You can call it democratic policing, you can call it legislative control. And there have been some successes in creating frameworks for this kind of reform, but almost all the examples have failed in practice. Whether we're talking about Seattle or Oakland or New York, while transparency and democracy has been pushed, it hasn't succeeded. Um, and this isn't necessarily because the, the goals are bad, like, yeah, sure, transparency and accountability are better than opacity and lawlessness, but the structures don't comprehend the power relationships at play. One power relationship is that democracy itself is kind of exclusionary. Those who have access to democratic power sometimes silence those who uh, don't have that same power. Structural racism and poverty excludes voices from democracy, uh, and it always has. Another power relationship that isn't acknowledged is that there are really no sanctions for failing to follow the legislative or rulemaking or reform making rules. Uh, and law without remedies is usually violated and has been in these cases. Another power relationship is that the technologies are written by and interpreted by and evaluated by technocrats. And technocrats tend to be in the same sort of class and world and education uh, as people who are protected by the police. And they haven't necessarily been very critical about those same police powers. Even if they're critical, they haven't really interrogated some of the structural uh, biases. And relatedly, some of them are actually being paid by those same companies, right? There's definitely a concern that the money version of what is happening, who is funding it, is, you know, if not co-opting, softening some of the reform uh, there. Plus, of course, all of this sort of technocratic reform assumes that the surveillance is there. Uh, and so it may reform it, but not uh, ever, it might legitimize it in its way. I know that's one of Hamid Khan's uh, really helpful insights uh, out there. Um, I started being a reformer, I started being a supporter of this kind of reform. Uh, but, you know, in retrospect, you know, I, I think it's a little naive. Um, I think that the politics and the power and the money have co-opted this kind of technocratic reform and it hasn't uh, been successful. I mean, I have somewhere in my article this line that says, you know, in theory, the technocratic lens should work. But if you look at the history, it never has. And that should sort of tell us something about where to go in the future. So what's my proposal for the reform? Well, I call it the tyrant test. Uh, and what it means is that we have to assume that the technology we're creating, this police technology we're creating is to be given to the metaphorical tyrant. And then we have to work backwards from there. Like, what are you going to do to stop this tyrant from using it? I mean, you may just ban it all, or maybe you'll say there are some parts that you want, but what are you going to do? Um, and I build this metaphor of the tyrant around another time we've handed power to a tyrant, uh, namely, which is the founding of our country, right? We were concerned about tyranny when we created a constitutional structure. 
and the US Constitution, the Fourth Amendment, and most of our rights come from a field of a very real tyrant. Um, we didn't hand over power blindly. We built structural protections and powers and rights and all of the above to try to check that uh, power. Um, and we did it at this, uh, again around the racial reckoning uh, before and after the Reconstruction Amendments. Right? The tyranny of racial oppression that surrounded slavery in the post-slavery years was directly tied to the same form of racial tyranny. Uh, with the same kinds of searches and seizures and police powers that we're concerned about now. So what are some of these structural, legal, constitutional protections that form the tyrant test? Well, one is an idea of limited powers uh, requiring written authorization before government can act on any of these technologies. Another is judicial checks requiring warrants and high standards of proof and notice and authority. Another is community checks, building juries and grand jury-like structures in the community to give the green light or the red light to new surveillance technologies. Uh, some are, you know, one is enforceable rights and remedies for violations. Uh, some is a subset of limitations. There are real subset of limitations on the Fourth Amendment about what you could get at the time of the founding. You couldn't get certain things just because we didn't want the government uh, to ever get those. So we should bring back that sort of original idea. Uh, and then, of course, local power sources to check this use. So I'm envisioning this all of the above approach, a structural approach that is sort of an understanding of tyranny. And in the article, I build this metaphor out. Uh, to say that this would be centered in the communities, again, if the idea of juries and grand juries as sort of local central powers to check government power, it has to be rights-based and enforceable, it has to be limited with structural checks and balances, and it has to consciously reflect the equal protection elements of the 14th Amendment with race, because race was central to that concern and it has to be central now. It would be legal and structural, but also controlled by the communities impacted by the surveillance. Um, no existing surveillance system or technology would pass the tyrant test at this, at this moment. Um, and that also should say something. We would have to build some of these uh, legislative protections. Now, is it perfect? Of course not. Um, the Constitution is an imperfect guarantor of liberty and has always been. Um, it promises a lot, but it's failed in most aspects in terms of certain communities. Um, but I purposely chose that sort of constitutional frame to get people across the spectrum to see that the revolution being called for is a revolution that they should buy into. That's part of that true uh, a sense of a distrust of government that's actually very American. That tyranny could be a unifying, or fear of tyranny could be a unifying uh, uh, formation to be able to push back on the growing use of police as instruments of that tyranny. And if nothing else, it sort of shifts the frame of reference on how we should think about these new police powers. It is a big reform idea with lots of uh, uh, nuances, but that's a general sense of where I think we've been and where I'd like to go. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Andrew. And I'll turn it over to uh, Bennett. And before I do also, just to prompt that there is a Q&A feature here. So um, we will be doing uh, further discussion after the introductory remarks. If anybody in the audience has questions, please put them there and we'll try to work them into the subsequent conversation. Take it away, Bennett. Okay, thanks, Phil. And also thanks to the Michigan Journal of Law Reform and Ronica and the rest of the symposium staff for organizing this. Um, it's, it's funny, often on these types of panels, I'm the outlier. Um, and uh, sometimes I feel that uh, I'm a very different voice from Andrew's voice, but I think there might be some overlap in the way uh, we are thinking about things. I'll leave that for the audience to decide. So basically for years now, I've, I've been thinking and speculating about how advances in technology might actually increase community safety and lead to more egalitarian policing. So I'm sort of on the pro-technology side, um, unlike what normally happens at these types of uh, conferences. Um, so I've been thinking about how technologies can reduce the use of police force, especially against those of us who are black and brown. Um, and at bottom, one of the things that I want to do is encourage all of us to think about how the communities that experience the brunt of unequal policing can actually play a role in deciding what technologies might benefit them. Um, are there technologies out there that can address persistent problems? Are there technologies that we could easily imagine that can address persistent problems? Maybe one, I, I could think of one difference between Andrew's approach and mine, uh, rather than communities sort of serving as a check, I'm actually imagining communities at the table at the get-go and deciding what types of technologies they want um, to help make their communities safer. So anyway, to get a little bit more into this, first focusing on community safety, I think before we sort of you know, dismissed, dismissed technologies as being dystopian and big brother run amok, uh, we should think long and hard 
about how we can harness technologies to contribute to reduction of crime. Um, and, you know, just think of some of the technologies we've, we already have and the future technologies we can imagine. You know, usually when we think of surveillance cameras and eye in the sky technology and facial recognition technology and other biometric technologies, we think about how flawed these techn technologies are and we rail against them. And, and Andrew did a little bit about this in his presentation, but maybe we should also think about how these technologies can be improved, how the wrinkles can be ironed out and how they might contribute to public safety in a way that is not discriminatory. You know, so consider the same technologies that we already have, but without the flaws. Now add to them like, you know, the instantaneous access to big data and the use of like remote scanners to detect for unlawful weapons, the widespread of, you know, short range communication technologies that could obviate the need for traffic stops or even self-driving cars that could obviate the need for traffic stops. Think about machine learning. All of this can contribute to deterring criminal activity and improving apprehension. And I know all of this might sound frightening, it usually does, but before I address that, consider something else. These technologies also have the potential to reduce unjustified police violence. So there's some evidence, admittedly not much, that surveillance cameras already deter some police behavior that's problematic. Now imagine what, we, what happens when we add other technologies. So scanners, for example, could tell the police whether a suspect is armed or not. Um, access to big data could tell the police whether someone has a history of nonviolence reducing the risk of unjustified escalation. Future technologies might be able to enable officers to disable a weapon from a distance rather than having them engage one-on-one. -on -one. Moreover, all of these technologies leave a data trail to create more accountability on the back end. Um, I also want to mention a discussion I had with Professor Brandon Marquez a few weeks ago about predictive policing and algorithms and risk assessment tools. Imagine if we flip the script and use the same tools to predict which police officers have the highest risk of engaging in unjustified uses of force. So again, before we write off technologies, we should think seriously about how technologies might benefit us. Um, finally, I've also been exploring how technologies can help deracialize policing. So obviously, and maybe not obviously, but cameras do not have implicit biases or suffer from unconscious racism. Technology, when deployed correctly, may be able to help us move closer to real reasonable suspicion so that looks, encounters, stops, and frisk turn on actual reasonable suspicion rather than the proxy of race. And I could go more in detail about that later, but I think what I wanna do is say a few more words about policing and technology and the pushback that I normally get. So, some of the technologies that we are talking about today sound privacy diminishing. Um, but again, the point is to imagine how communities, especially black, black and brown communities, can harness these technologies to reduce racial, racialized policing and make policing more egalitarian, and yes, to reduce crime. And I recognize that current technologies are not racially neutral. I recognize too that technology is anything but an innocent bystander when it comes to mass incarceration. Uh, you know, the sociologist and futurist Ruha Benjamin at Princeton has even coined the term the new Jim Code, play on the new Jim Crow, to warn that technologies can perpetuate and exacerbate inequalities, especially, especially when they have the veneer of being free from human influence and biases. But none of this suggests that bias technology is inevitable. Um, biases can be identified and eradicated or at least minimized. So it's really, again, about imagining diverse people at the table in creating technology and in saying what kind of technology they want. Um, so not a technocratic approach where you have sort of, you know, those in the Ivy League uh, sort of as the buffer between the police and the people. I'm talking about the people there sort of saying, um, this is what we want, um, make it happen. So it's not about imagining a top-down approach to technology, but a bottoms-up approach. And it's an imag about imagining what benefits might flow when communities that have been the most policed had the agency to produce technology 
to create code, recode, drop a remix. And again, to borrow from Ruha Benjamin, what interests me is thinking about how techno science can be appropriated and reimagined for more just ends. So those are my thoughts. I will stop there. Um, so I want to also thank the journal, thank Ronica, all the staff, um, Phil for, for corralling us. And I'm really pleased to be on this panel with all of you. Um, you know, it's interesting. You always have an idea of what you're going to say when you sit down to these things, when you listen to other speakers, when you have a different idea of what you're going to say. I'm first going to say, um, although I work for the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and many things I say will be, you know, the association's recommendations, but com my comments today are my comments and should not be attributed to the association, because my thoughts on this go a little further than maybe our internal policy goes. Um, you know, my, it's interesting to me when I sit on these panels, I feel like the conversation always starts at the point of regulation. And I don't think that's where our conversations need to start. I think the conversation needs to start at really what is the, what is the outcome that people are looking for? And if the outcome is a better, more streamlined, more efficient form of current policing, then we should regulate current technologies. Um, if that is not the outcome we're seeking, and I don't believe it should be, then we have to have an entirely different kind of conversation. Because right now, I will say early on in the body camera debate, um, my position to people was always, you are not going to fix bias in policing, racism in policing, violence in policing by putting a camera on it. You can't put a technology on a deeply flawed and problematic system and then expect it to come out better on the back end. Um, all that's really resulted in is more camera footage sometimes. And I say sometimes because oftentimes we found problematic police departments were still problematic police departments. And they said, I don't know, it just didn't come on. It fell off, the battery wasn't working. Gee, this thing is complicated. I didn't know how to work it. None of that is surprising, right? And so much so that even in Baltimore, you found uh, a police officer who didn't realize that the camera buffered, right? That it was recording about 30 minutes before you turn it on. So it literally recorded him taking evidence, planting it in a dumpster, walking back to his cohort, turning on his body camera and then saying, hey, gee, guys, I think I saw somebody throw something over there, like a bad movie, right, in that dumpster, and then went and found the evidence he had just planted. And so, you know, when we talk about technology, I think before we talk about can we refine it, can we make it better, can we make it less biased, we need to talk about why are we using it in the first place. And when you start looking at it from that perspective, the problem in U.S. policing didn't just come up and it is not going to just be fixed because you put new toys on it, new high-tech toys on it. What that is doing, though, is creating a situation where you're really privatizing policing. And I say that because although the police are technically not a private agency, these companies who are developing all these tools are, and they're developing them for profit, right? They're not developing them for like a secure society, a nicer society, more just, more efficient. They're developing them to make money. And when you put that motivation on top of again, a really already problematic system of policing in the US that over polices black and brown people and marginalized and multi-marginalized communities, they overcharge those folks and they over incarcerate them. And if we're at a point where we're trying to talk about reducing mass incarceration, we cannot then jointly figure out how to massage technology that is streamlining that system and making it more efficient to criminalize people, to investigate them, to prosecute them and to incarcerate them. And so that's the position that I am starting from. And I know I've you know, been critiqued where people will say, well, the train's already out of the station. They're already using all these things. You know, the toothpaste is out of the tube. My position on that is trains go back to stations. And even if you can't get the toothpaste back in the tube, you can wipe it off the counter, right? Like this is not insurmountable. And it is not that we've like, oh, well, this is how it's always been. And therefore it must always be. It's just not a thing. It's not a thing. It's not a thing in US history. And it should not be the way that we approach this. I think we're at a dangerous moment where we're jumping too quickly to regulation and not trying to figure out how to solve the fundamental problems, right? So I know um, when Ben has started, he said something, our Professor Capers, forgive me for being overly informal, because I've never actually met you before, um, you know, started with this idea of community safety, community security. That means a lot of different things to a lot of people. And for most people I know, they don't jump to, well, if I just had better technology to rein in the police, that's not the thinking, um, you know, that most people bring to it. Right? It's a much fuller conversation. And that's why people like to sort of reduce it to abolition hashtags and deep on the police hashtags. But what people are really talking about in terms of community safety is a much more holistic picture. 
right? And the policing keeps ending up back here where they say, well, what are the problems? And they point out, well, you've got all these other problems in society that nobody is actually addressing. And then we put all the money in policing. So, you know, again, from a framing, a frame perspective, it needs to be a much broader conversation than the technology. And it needs to start with the question of what problem are we accounting for? And does this technology even have a place in addressing it? Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna go with two more things that I wanna pass to Tom. One of the ways in which I always approach it, you know, we've seen the use of algorithmic technologies to make decisions on bail, on whether or not somebody should be released uh, before a trial. Fundamentally, you don't need a technology to solve the problem that we hold way too many people before a court hearing, right? And that is just going back to what it used to be, which is the presumption that somebody is not held over. And then a very narrow slice of opportunities to hold someone over, right? Where someone's really truly a fight or is really truly potentially dangerous, then let them make an argument to the court as to why they have to hold that person versus where we're at now where the presumption is you hold everybody and the person has to find a way to argue as to why they shouldn't be held over for trial, right? Like there are very non-technological ways to address that. And yet, you know, the idea is we could just put a technology on it. The last thing I'll say is, you know, there was a discussion about transparency and is this or is this not a functional way? And I know it also happened earlier in the week. Is it or is it not a functional way to address this? You know, if you have, you have to give notice to the council, you have to do whatever. From the perspective of, and this is, I am speaking from NACDL's perspective, transparency is key not because that is going to fix the problems with policing or the problems with technology, but you simply cannot prosecute people and use tools that you either don't disclose or do not allow the defense to analyze. This is a fundamental problem. I know Andrew started us with the constitution and the how do you rein in the tyrant. So some of those protections were protections for the accused in a criminal case where the state is wielding their power to deprive someone of their life or liberty that person has to have the ability to confront the evidence against them, the witnesses against them, which means they have to know what is being used. Oftentimes they don't when it comes to technologies. They have to be able to say, well, does this thing you use that says I was in this place or my DNA was found on this thing, does it even do what it says it does? Who has checked that? Who has been able to kick the tires and say, okay, when we ran this sample through, it did come out in the way expected when they described it? Nobody generally. Because what we find, again, when you go back to the privatized interest is the companies who are developing these tools are then saying, well, this is our proprietary software. We can't share that. You can't know what's behind that black box, sorry. And that's just assuming that you know it was used in the first place, right? And I know in Phil's case where he's representing someone who was wrongly identified by face recognition, it wasn't that there was some form of disclosure that allows someone to say, did this thing even work? Or who else did it identify? If you're talking about face recognition, you know, that could feed to my theory of the case as a defense lawyer, if I say, well, no, it's this person that always, he always gets confused with or whatever it is. The only reason they knew is I think the cops said something offhand of like, well, when we ran the picture through the machine, it said, and they're like, wait, what picture, what machine? And that should not be <laughs> the only way disclosure happens. And so, you know, in the small, the smaller sense of transparency, I, you know, I think it is fundamental that you should not be able to use anything and then hide it by saying we use this for lead generation purposes or you know, we can't, this is proprietary, we can't share it with you. If you can use it to incarcerate someone, you can disclose it and let them test it. You can disclose it and let them challenge it. And that's a fundamental protection against tyrants, against police, against um, basically people being deprived of their liberty without due process of law. So I will leave it there and turn it over to Hamid. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the invite. And again, appreciate uh, Veronica's uh, constantly kind of very diligently following <laughs> up with us and coming to, to this panel. So uh, again, my name is Hamed. I go by he, him at Stop LAPD Spying Coalition out here in Los Angeles. Uh, I, I just wanted to share a few thoughts. Well, first of all, just uh, beginning with, with, uh, with, uh, with, with the claim that uh, we completely reject any notion of reform. Um, and, and I'll talk about it, why. I think what's important about that is that how do we arrive to this point, what, who informs us? How are we guided? Whose lived experiences are the ones that really tutor us uh, as to why we arrive at this point that the only way to change this system is to dismantle it, uh, is to abolish it. And it's nothing new that what I'm saying, it's nothing new that the abolitionists have been talking about. There's a whole history, there's a whole cultural resistance that we are building on uh, that has been going on for centuries around the world. 
So uh, the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition story that how it came together might be helpful in understanding that why evolution is necessary. And it's, it's, it's our duty to fight towards that. I myself have been, I'm an immigrant from Pakistan. I was born and raised in Pakistan. I don't have any formal education in the United States. I've been living in the US since the late 1970s and, uh, and, 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 and very much my own experiences as an immigrant started informing me of, of how the system operates and how it deems the, the, the otherness of the person how you become the threat to the system and how then you know of laws and and various other codes are then deployed on you whether you of your status as an undocumented immigrant or of a particular nationality of a particular you know perceived faith and this that and the other uh, nothing new again there's a long history behind that as well and as I got involved more and more into community-based and grassroots organizing going back in the mid to late 1980s, uh, what, was, what became increasingly evident was that, that the system that we are operating is, is fundamentally flawed by design. And by which I mean that it's not just like, and people talk about broken systems, that they're not broken systems, and others have spoken about it too, but it's very well crafted and designed for to serve the purposes of white supremacy, to serve the purposes of capitalism, to serve the purposes of patriarchy, to serve the purposes of, of racism. And then increasingly now in this day and age, serve this whole dogma of scientific objectivity is, is taking over as well. Um, fast forward, uh, the, in, in, the, in the, around 2010, a bunch of us uh, came together. And when I say folks who had been involved, I've been involved in organizing in LA for about 35 years or so, uh, that folks who had, had historically been involved in organizing against police violence and police brutality started looking at uh, that how increasingly counterterrorism and counterinsurgency tactics were being incorporated into domestic policing. Obviously nothing new, there's a long history behind that, going back to, I don't wanna go back too far, but just post Vietnam, we saw that. But, but again, you know, we use this work technology rather loosely as well, but uh, I'll use it for the purposes of describing it with the, with the advent of data processing and information collection, it, it started moving at the speed of light. So that's what led to the coming together of Stop LAPD Spine Coalition. And that's where the story begins. Now the question was, where is it situated? Well, it is situated in Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles, uh, which if folks have ever been to LA, I mean, that's one of the largest uh, a community and residents of unhoused people within a 50 block area, predominantly overwhelmingly black and extremely poor communities. And it's, it's almost like a tent city. Now, people asked myself that uh, coming out of South Asian network, being on the front lines of the immigrant rights movement, fight against uh, post 9-11 impact on the community, uh, the Muslim South Asian Arab community, why Skid Row? And I think it was necessary to situate ourselves and, and learn from the lived experiences of, of the community, which, which has been historically marginalized and targeted. It wasn't so, 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 so for us, it was important to build our work, to understand and, and check our own language and narrative as well, that what does invasion of privacy mean to people? What does disorder mean? What does public safety mean? And then, you know, as we move on as to what does this, this technology and this language around big data mean to us as well? And increasingly what we, what we found out, and this is we, we literally before we even went public, and when I say we, there's a bunch of us coming together, being out on the streets of LA, started speaking to people, started speaking to communities, sitting there and talking to day laborers and asking them that what does see something say something mean to you? What, is, what does being a suspect body mean to you? Sitting down with queer trans folks, with Gender Justice LA and their members, that how does being a trans body and how does being a trans person, being a suspect body mean to you? Of course, being in Skid Row, several conversations, literally people coming out of their tents and having these conversations, that what does it mean to be an unhoused person, undocumented immigrants, youth coming out of cages uh, because of gang databases and gang injunctions. And what it did was it helped us in really understanding our own vocabulary and language as well, that no, this is way bigger than invasion of privacy, because one, it completely individualizes uh, the impact rather than the whole collective harm that happens. So what, what, we, what we see is that this is an intentionality to cause harm. There is a methodology that has all been designed and where we are today is nothing new. It's not a moment in time, but it's a continuation of history. 
So whether we go back to, and there are other people who've done a lot of research, uh, I want to uh, honor uh, Simone Brown's work around dark matters and other work that has happened, whether it was the lantern laws of the early 1700s, or whether it was the black codes after emancipation, whether it was the red squads in the 1880s after the Haymarket strike, whether it was the FBI, uh, or whether it was the NSA, or whether it was uh, 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 John Ashcroft in the TIPS initiative, the ter terrorism in information prevention system. So there's a whole lineage that we were looking at, and there was a whole trajectory that we was lo looking at that this is something like we need to really ground in ourselves in that historic reality and, and that, that historic trajectory, and then look at the current realities and then start building our fight. So that's where, you know, just kind of setting, setting, setting the tone for this conversation that the fight is not about how to make the execution of these systems different. The fight is to really understand the very basic premise and intent that these systems have been built upon, and then to look at it that they don't, nothing happens in isolation. Technology is not, our police surveillance is not operating in isolation. We have developed a whole process of understanding calling it the stalker state, that how public sector agencies, private sector agencies, social media, corporations, various law enforcement, various other entities, how information constantly moves within the system. So, our, so it's not to say that you know that you know that you can you can change bias in technology because only if we had access to that data or only if we were designing those technologies, we have to look at the broader ecology, we have to look at the broader landscape, and 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 that's what really helps us in then building uh, that knowledge, that collective knowledge on the ground, which is based on built on people's own lived experiences, and then from there start our fight towards dismantling and abolishing these systems. Thank you all. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's interesting to, to use um, Andrew's frame uh, that on this panel, there's not a single sort of defender or advocate of the technocratic approach. The, you know, let's just uh, uh, implement a, a few sort of rules and, and checks. Um, and, and I think that's actually indicative of, uh, of, of, of where we are. We, we actually wind up with the technocratic approach when we're not just following the trust approach because, um, you know, it's what happens, I think, when uh, techno capitalism, 21st century, but also the whole history of American capitalism meets uh, the realities of political power and sort of what uh, what what people feel like they can get done. And so we all compromise on sort of tweaks that that may actually make things worse in some cases, um, but certainly don't get to the root of the problem. Um, each of you have sort of spelled out a a different vision, and I guess I'd like to challenge each of you to say uh, uh, to to answer two things. First. Um, of, of things that are going on today, of, of practical things that advocates are working on or pushing for, what is one thing that you think is happening in the reform space that you'd really, uh, that you think can work? And second, uh, what is the utopian thing you think could work? Um, sort of taking away a, a little bit of the practicality. If, if, if you could write the law or the constitutional amendment or the rule uh, that, that would most bring about your vision, what would that be? So, you know, for Professor Capers, maybe how, what is it that you could do to actually put impacted communities in the lead on deployment of technology in the face of, uh, you know, all of the forces of politics and capitalism that marginalize uh, the, the same groups that you want in charge? For, uh, for Ahmed, um, you know, what could we do to actually activate uh, an abolitionist coalition? Um, you know, sort of along the lines of the question that Adam has put in the Q&A um, uh, against power for, for Andrew, um, Professor Ferguson, uh, you know, what, what implements the tyrant test? And then for Juana, you know, you talked about let's, uh, let's, let's wipe the toothpaste off. Uh, how, how would you wipe the toothpaste off? I'll, uh, I'll randomly call on uh, Jumana first. So how do we wipe the toothpaste off? I mean, I think, you know, I'll say, you know, the, the utopian vision has nothing to do with policing, right? It marginalizes policing to the, to the nether regions and it focuses on what is a healthy community and what is a secure community? How do we build a community where people have access to all the things they need, right? Whether it is mental health care, actual health care, we're in the middle of a pandemic and people are not guaranteed health care. Uh, living wages, right? Homes that are livable, homes, schools that, you know, have all the things they need, like books and heat, 
you know, and I, and I say that not tongue in cheek because there are schools that sometimes like books and heat. And so, you know, investment wise, the utopian vision is one very much that does not focus on the police state at all um, and does not have a role for it. Uh, yes, that's an abolitionist frame, but I think, you know, if you look historically, every time you have sort of a crisis moment in policing and people sort of do the digging and they come back and say, well, you know, there's all these services that don't get provided. And over time, we continue to put money into policing and defund any other services that might actually build community safety and security, right? People's personal security, the ability to feed their families and house their families and, you know, exist in the ways that, you know, people who tend to be able to do these kinds of discussions get to exist, right? Who live more comfortable lives, who don't have to think about, you know, can I even find fresh vegetables in my neighborhood to feed my kid versus, you know, the, the people who struggle with like, well, I can't get my kid to eat a vegetable. It's, it's a whole different conversation if you can't find a vegetable, right? And so that's, you know, utopian vision. Um, you know, what would I like to see in place? I think there should be absolutely no profit motive anywhere in the criminal legal system. I don't think that should exist. I think if government wants to use technology in the criminal legal system, it has to be publicly created, publicly scrutinized, and have a clear understanding of what is it for. I think the problem is, you know, when you're driving, when corporations are driving the technology um, and they're developing them for profit, there is no public interest at stake. There is no public interest or community safety at the heart of that conversation, right? There is very much a profit motive at the heart of that conversation and you're not gonna get a good outcome there. You know, I think the question of even like, can you turn this technology to find bad cops? Probably, I'm sure you can develop that technology, but you know what else? They have all the records, right? Like it's not like the policing agencies don't have the records of all the incidents that any given officer has been involved in. And so there's a whole different conversation about, you know, what does it look like when you have um, overprotective laws that shield police officers from any accountability of their actions while they're on duty? And then says, well, if we had technology to look at it, I mean, there's still a political will problem, right? But so, you know, the larger question is, how do you get people to talk about policing in the way they would talk about anything else that has been this wildly expensive and inefficient, right? Because all we hear is there's more crime, murders are rising, we need more police. That conversation hasn't changed in decades, right? And so even if you're separating it out, which you cannot, and comment, I would not, right? From the conversation of the whole extension and how it, perpetuates uh, a white supremacist framework, that by itself as a business model, and I'm not a business person, but as a business model or as a scientific precept, like if you kept saying, well, we keep doing this and it keeps not working, like at some point in any other realm, someone would say, well, we should do something different. And I think the fundamental problem is that we can't get to that moment. Um, but like I said, for me, if technology is going to be used, it's, it's a public tool that is publicly accessible, that is publicly scrutinized, and is never hidden in the process. I mean, I think the other part is the discussion that needs to be had, which I feel like started earlier in the week, uh, which is, should this ever be used in a context where people are being deprived of their lives, of their liberties, where communities are being fractured, where the end goal is really to remove somebody and then cage them? Should these things ever be used? And I don't believe that they should. I don't believe algorithms should be involved in that process because I don't believe in a lot of the process. Uh, but fundamentally, if it's going to be used, it cannot be for profit or hidden or protected by a profit motive. Uh, Phil, can I go next? <laughs> so I, I, you know, I, I think Juman and, and I probably would agree on a lot of things uh, more that this uh, panel might suggest. So I've, I've, I, I actually spend a lot of my time sort of thinking about um, sort of utopian visions. Uh, so there's this whole school of Afro-pessimism out there. I'm actually sort of more like a, a, I identify as an Afro-futurist. And one of the things that uh, motivates my thinking um, is, you know, the fact that this country is slated to become majority minority by the year 2044. And my concern is we keep thinking, oh, well, you know, white supremacy is so entrenched, it's, there's never going to be anything we could do about it. But that's sort of forgetting sort of the potential we have just numerically, it's sort of like almost falling into sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy where we always sort of see ourselves as like, oh, there's always going to be white supremacy. Actually, there might not be if we start thinking about ways that we can change everything uh, when the country looks very differently. So if this is a majority minority country, 
And you actually have communities sort of like having more of a decision about what they want policing to look like and what they want everything to look like. First of all, I'm, an ima I'm imagining a utopian vision where crime has already been reduced dramatically because we don't have wealth inequality like we have right now. We have more jobs. We have, uh, you know, uh, we, we've addressed like things like climate change. We've addressed a whole host of issues that are already drivers of crime. But I'm also recognizing that no matter what we do, we might still have things like um, sexual assault. We might still have things like domestic violence. We might still have things like, you know, heat of passion murders. So there will probably have to be some policing. I'm imagining a much smaller footprint for policing, but still some policing. And I'm imagining utopian vision where people are thinking, okay, well, in this world, where we are actually calling the shots because it is possible if we start to think that way. What do we want that policing to look like? Do we want to have technology in that future? Is that technology that's gonna benefit us? And it might be that when we really like think about it and think about the kind of control we would have, we would think like, okay, well, if we're in control, we're actually gonna decide that private companies are not generating technology. It's actually done publicly. We're actually gonna decide that actually, you know something, we're better off being sentenced, if we have to get sentenced, by uh, you know, an algorithm that we can understand, not black box, but a, a transparent algorithm than the black box of a judge who might have all these biases that we can't get at. So you know, these are all different ideas, but uh, again, sort of I'm much more of a positive sort of forward-looking thinker when it comes to what we can do. Ahmed, do you want to go? I don't want to. So uh, I can, uh, my utopian vision is not a utopian vision, but sort of a practical idea of where I think we could go in the current world, which is, I think, a rejection of the prior ways that we have gone, including the trust and sort of technocratic approach, and trying to think more structurally with a focus on power. Like it's all about power. It's all about who controls the power and where the power should be located. And trying to think about structural ways to shift power is what I think. You know, again, the article is about 87 pages with 500 footnotes, sort of delves into a lot of that. Uh, so it's the best I got right now in terms of what I think utopia is, but it's certainly not a utopia because there are too many sort of structural problems of structural racism, poverty, and inequality in America today to actually have and envision that utopia. You asked about practical reform, things that are working, and I have to say I'm honestly quite um, depressed right now in terms of what I have seen. Um, I, I wrote this book uh, sort of at the end of the Obama administration called Rise of Big Data Policing, that was sort of a recognition that most of the sort of experiments with things like predictive policing and facial recognition had failed um, because they were, they were just terribly well, they just weren't thought out. I mean, they were just terrible. I mean, they were terrible ideas perhaps to begin with, but they weren't implemented and there was so many structural problems that it was, it was clear. And then we had this sort of national discussion about race and structural racism and the problems. And my hope was we had moved past like the obvious errors. Like people were pitching, you know, algorithms as being neutral and like without race. And of course that's false. Of course that wasn't uh, the truth. And we seemed for a moment to recognize that that conversation that we could have, you know, an algorithm solve our problems. Like, you know, there was a moment in time in America where everyone was all into like technology is a good, not like big tech is bad. We had this like naive faith that data was gonna improve everything. Of course that was wrong. Um, but we moved to a conversation where I thought we had interrogated and recognized that that premise was false. And that now I'm reading headlines about like San Francisco where we're going back to like, have more surveillance technologies and link up network cameras and other progressive, you know, presumably progressive cities saying we want more surveillance at this moment. And so it feels like we've sort of lost the thread of whatever sort of consciousness we had about structural racism and how surveillance technology was amplifying that. And we're going backwards, not forwards. And, uh, and I don't see many positive, you know, reform, reform in quotes, uh, 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 a paths out there because it feels like very regressive now uh, in terms of what we're doing. Like people are back to a trust lens and, and maybe even worse. 
Oops, sorry for that. Uh, so, so just a couple of things. I think, first of all, this, this word utopia has been thrown around quite a bit, and we need to just take a step back as to who is really living in utopia. Is this people who are envisioning a better world who are living in a utopia and building and building on that history of cultural resistance? Or is it the people who are expecting that things can change by reforming them, by tinkering around the edges, by making, by kind of just showing that maybe the execution can be done in a different way? So I think that's, first of all, we need to kind of check our language as well. I mean, at least I would suggest that, that, you know, what does utopia even mean and how do we envision these things? Secondly, uh, uh, Phil, you were asking about building an abolitionist coalition. Um, I stop LAPD spying coalition is very very much a model, I would, I would say, that, that has been really building its work. But I think the bigger fight in this, in this, in this journey that, that we are up towards abolition that we are on is that one, both individually and collectively, there is, there's a lot of unlearning that needs to happen. Because I think our orientation has been is as such that you know we gravitate towards like you know this is the only answer and we and we react to that. So secondly, that there is no delete button. It's not like you know you're going to hit button and police is going to vanish. That ain't going to happen. So it's it's a multi generational journey that we are on. So that's more for our own personal understanding as well. Secondly, uh, I think the bigger fight is obviously, you know, police violence and white supremacy and structural racism and all, all forms of, you know, just trauma that communities face. That fight continues. But I think the bigger struggle is internal within our movements. We have to look at and very, very clearly examine academic complicity, that how deeply the academy is complicit in providing both intellectual roadmaps uh, uh, and uh, in, in, in strengthening the st structure, designing tools that continue to to harm people. So I think a lot of self-reflection and self-challenging needs to happen. Secondly, the nonprofit complicity that is rampant, that how going back to the creation of foundations who became the shock absorbers for the system, that 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 how much harm they have done uh, uh, to our movement building as well. And in that, I would also like, you know, and, and you work for the ACLU, but looking at the complicity of ACLU in moving these systems by kind of just renewing that utopia, for example, like the community control over police surveillance was C-COPs. So is that even possible? So we have actively organized against C-COPs as well, to the extent that finally, and, and it's, it's, it was, it's, it's good to report that finally, the Southern California chapter of the ACLU said, listen to the people, and they wrote a letter to the police commission in LA saying that, please do not use our C-COPs model, because it doesn't work. It's not going to work. And our hope is other chapters around the country would follow their lead as well. So I think the, 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 the point here being that, you know, we, we, we continue to kind of limit our, our understanding as well, because when we talk about algorithms, you know, the, the conventional understanding is that it's a feedback loop. Right. OK, so if you, you know, just plug in racist data, racist data is going to come out fine. You know, there is some something to, to be said about that, too. But we have to look at the broader ecology. That, that these algorithms are operating in. That how does this, what was the academic complicity that, that people like Professor Jeffrey Branthingham, the chair of anthropology department designed that, that, that Predpol algorithm along with some mathematicians, which, which was built on counterinsurgency in Iraq and Afghanistan because their initial funding was from the Department of Defense. To, to look at and predict insurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan. So now you have the academy complicit, you have funding from the Department of Defense, then you bring that into like, then Department of Justice comes into and BJA. They start funding this thing here. I bring in the Vera Institute. That Vera Institute back in 2014, 2000, were banging these drums about Operation Laser and Laser Model in Los Angeles, and then about, about bail uh, uh, reforms and, and risk assessments and everything else. And they even co-wrote an article with along with the, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, all these accolades on Operation Laser. Operation Laser became a major trauma, which was a big fight for us in Los Angeles. And we, we successfully dismantled predictive policing in Los Angeles. So I think in, in a sense that when we look at it, and last thing I would say is that in this, in this uh, uh, building this abolition coalition, that how do we broaden our understanding as well? Because now we just released a report in November, automating banishment, the surveillance and policing of looted land, which really links historically to like that, that this is still settler colonization. 
It's, it's not something that, you know, it has, it has gone or things have changed. So how do we then make these connections historically to, to, the, to, to the U.S. Army, which was out there kind of just removing and banishing people from land for white settlers to come in? Similarly, you have to make these connections, that relationship between real estate developers, gentrification, uh, and, and uh, other actors within the system as well, that how police remains that tip of that white supremacist knife, where how race and, and poverty and suspect bodies are policed for control of land. So I just wanted to throw in, and I think this is how we build our, our uh, an abolitionist coalition, which is under no no false impression that you know the illusion that tomorrow it's going to just vanish. No, the fight is long. It's just it is our moment in this moment in this generation. What are we doing that continues to build? And it's it's a multi generational fight. I have two questions I hope to get to. I don't know if we'll have the time, but first I want to incorporate a couple uh, questions that came from, from members of the audience who are asking about uh, sort of uh, technology to, to combat police violence. Um, and uh, Professor Capers, you mentioned the idea of, you know, maybe a, an algorithm that predicts police violence, but I actually want to ask a, a slightly different question. It's really for anybody who wants to jump in um, that, that is inspired by the, the questions in the box, which is, are there ways uh, setting aside government top-down technology, are there ways that civilians can use technology to either push back against surveillance, to push back against the police state? Is, in other words, is there a role for the kind of surveillance model that, uh, that, is, that is civilian driven? And if so, what is that? Uh, does anybody have any ideas what that looks like? So, so I'll just go first and I'll be very brief. I mean, there's something called surveillance, looking, you know, from the bottom looking up. Uh, you know, which, uh, you know, we've been doing since the advent of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, smartphones. I mean, George Floyd, I mean, so many of the, the whole racial reckoning this country started to go through the summer of 2020 was because people on the ground had been using their own cameras to look at officers. So, you know, that's one way technology has already sort of had like a bottoms up sort of use. Um, to sort of shift the power dynamics. Does anyone else on the panel want to jump in on that? Just quickly, I think whenever we're thinking about technologies, we have to think about where the power resides. I mean, one, there are lots of flaws with police body cams, but the biggest flaw, of course, was that the data and footage stays with police. There's no reason for that. There's no reason why the customers or clients are police and not the communities, and that could change. I think one quick thing I would just say is that, you know, that uh, by going in that direction, direction, we are falling again into that trap of techno solutionism. That, you know, that's something that, that has been used um, to, to, to control and contain and criminalize, to expect that to kind of flip it around. Um, you know, just it's, it's, it's uh, I, I would say it's, it's, it's a false um, sort of a, a hope, but uh, it's rather than spending time on how to monitor, and this is exactly what Jamana Reese talked about, uh, body cameras, and we were the, the only group back in 2014-15 in LA who we released a report about body cameras as well, that why this is, this is, this is the wrong thing and it's, it's going to expand the surveillance state. But, you know, in a sense, we have constantly seen that. And here again, we can't see that in isolation just by itself. We have to look at that. What are the systems already in place for accountability, for monitoring? For example, the Los Angeles Police Commission has been in existence since 1926, where Los Angeles LAPD has gone through various reforms, including consent decree in 2001, but still remains the most murderous police department in the country. So, so either we do the, the de-escalate the training, either we do give them more money. So it's all about like, you know, just looking at it that the, the reforms that we are looking at are has been tried. It's nothing new. So so where is really our fight? The, 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 where is it situated? So if I could just jump in again, because Hamid, I don't disagree with you, but I have to say I'm so glad we had all of these technologies that we could deploy for January 6th to figure out who those insurrectionists were. 
So, well, that's a whole I, different thing than whether there was a yeah. fight for control that who controls white supremacy and who's running the system. I think, I mean, you know, that's a whole separate thing um, because we also challenge this notion about that they were domestic terrorists. No, because what it does is it weaves in, you know, people who are being targeted and, and labeled as terrorists as well into this conversation. They were just a part of the, the broader, I guess, the white brotherhood or sisterhood, if I was to say that. And it was, this is how this was being done. So, you know, so in, in a sense, and I think this this couple of days ago, this whole voting right piece by itself, like this legislation, if that's not a clear example of, of where, where we are at, I don't know what else would be. But anyways, just wanted to say that. So, Sorry, Jamal. Yeah, no, I just wanted to jump in on this um, and say two things. One is, you know, again, I think there's always the question of like, but can't we use technology to do what is it we're trying to do? Right. Because I'm, you know, I'm still of the mind that it's it's fascinating that you still need to argue that someone should be able to get paid in a way that allows them to eat and have shelter, that kids should be able to go to school and have books and heat. And that is the like how fundamental our issues are in this country, right? That you have people in Southern states who are in Northern states and lots of states who don't have clean water. There are places in America that just don't even have running water that comes to homes, right? Like, so some of these issues are so fundamental that we actually have to agree to confront them before we worry about, is there a technology that does it or how can we, or how can we? Like there has to be a commitment to confront that. And right now I don't see it. And when it comes to the question of January 6th, I will just say this, um, taking troubling policing practices, like the things we're seeing, like reverse search warrants where you don't know who's there and you say, you go to Google and say, open your sensor vault and tell us everybody whose device connected in this area at this time does not get made better because the thing that happened and the people we're searching for are the people that we find particularly onerous. It doesn't make it better. It is still a highly problematic practice. And to use that to legitimize it does not mean that they're actually going to address white supremacy or this you know, brotherhood or sisterhood or siblinghood that Hamid was talking about. It just means we're gonna further entrench those tools that will still be desperately deployed against black and brown people, non-citizens, um, you know, the LGBTQ community, marginalized and multi-marginalized people. So like one moment of use in a way that some people maybe feel good about does not in any way legitimate or make it a good idea or make it not a fundamental violation of the Constitution. And I think I, it's dangerous to, to think otherwise. I'd like to, to sort of make, make a follow-up point to Jimana's, which is uh, my client, Robert Williams, who's the, uh, everybody on this panel knows, is a man who is falsely identified by facial surveillance and arrested in Detroit, testified before a panel in, uh, in Congress about facial recognition technology. And one of the things that was striking is there was a bipartisan consensus uh, on that panel that, that facial recognition needed to be fixed. And an interesting thing is, from the right, that consensus was in large part driven by false arrests coming out of facial recognition of people uh, from the January 6th riots. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I think there's a real question in my mind. Uh, first of all, I agree with all of the sentiments from Jumana's uh, just uh, editorializing. Um, <clears throat> but there's also a question in my mind of, you know, did false arrests that came out of that technology being flawed, how much did that, in fact, further drive growth of white supremacism by making victims? Um, because that's what this technology inevitably does when it's misused and when it, when it makes mistakes, which, which it does. Um, I, I want to ask one more question. We're over time, but Ronica has uh, told me I can take the, the privilege if the panel is willing to stick around for one more, which is I'm really struck in these issues by the role that narrative plays on both sides. Um, on the pro-surveillance uh, side, narrative is so powerful because, uh, you know, the defense from the police and from the, the state, uh, from the technologists is always, you know, the, the person who was saved, the crime we solved. And, uh, and, and, and the narrative from, from the reform side or, or, uh, and the abolition side is often the mistakes. Uh, you know, my, my case, Robert Williams's case uh, has, has, has you know, been a, a point of narrative. Um, and also narrative plays an interesting role in that science fiction plays a very interesting role in the discussions and debates uh, around uh, technology and reform of surveillance. So I guess I would just ask as, as a sort of closing thought for folks to comment on what role they see narrative playing on, on either side of the reform debate, and then we'll wrap it. It's a hard question. Um, 
I think it's obviously incredibly powerful. I think that the reason why facial recognition has sort of is a bipartisan uh, fear, even though there's been no congressional movement on it, is because there's been really strong narratives, including the fact that the ACLU uh, ran the Congress people's faces through facial recognition and found that they were misidentified, which was actually very telling. The Congress, when I testified on the Hill, the congressmen were talking about that that's the reason I care about this issue is because you did it to me. Um, I think that narrative is also, unfortunately, can be really hard. If you've been tracking the stories about sort of crime spikes in various cities and sort of the debunking of that on Twitter, like the narrative of crime spikes is driving this sort of aggressive move. And so it's dangerous because narratives are important, but who um, controls narrative, who can fund narratives, who can sort of tell their story matters. And we know that, you know, a lot of the police have the uh, the power, the ability, the connections to actually make that narrative pretty strong. And so I worry a bit about the battle of narratives because I think that narrative has been pro-police for a long time. Um, but I do think it really matters because at the core narrative is about humanity. It's about the people. It's about things that you, it's not abstractions. It's about human beings and you know your clients, like the way he reacted when his kids saw him getting handcuffed. So you can't take that away. And so I think it's powerful because it's human. And when it's human, it's not algorithmic. And that might be for the best. Um, so I, I, you know, I think rather than narratives, we need to focus on needs because narratives can be used either way. Um, and sometimes the narrative gets us in the place where, um, and I've heard this in policy, so we don't want to talk about X person. Like they want the super innocent person with a really good story that has the child that watched them get arrested that is very sympathetic. Um, the system is just as problematic, even if the person doesn't fit the like perfect victim narrative of the system, right? Because the problem is the system and not the person. And even if the person is kind of objectionable and maybe did something really bad, that still doesn't mean the government should be able to rifle through everybody's everything, right? That's the fundamental piece of this is these are supposed to be government restraints. And I think the other issue I have with narratives is these things always get sold on narratives right? Because this is what we hear. Well, you know, if you, you need face recognition, because what if they're trafficking children across state lines? Nobody wants children to be trafficked. That's a horrible scenario, right? <laughs> what if the terrorists are coming to do something? It's a horrible scenario. But it, it leaves aside the fact that that is almost never the scenario in which these things are being used, right? So the question should be drawn back to what are the needs of communities? And should the government have this power? Full stop. And I think for most of these tools, the government should not have the power, you know, full stop. The narrative I get is useful in people's advocacy, but if you focus so much on the narrative, then you create the people who are deserving and not deserving. And that becomes highly problematic. We've seen it in every debate. Like in, you know, when you talk about questions of migration and citizenship and, and who can stay and who can't stay, uh, people were quick to say, we're not talking about the criminals. We're not talking about the criminals, the good immigrants, right? There's always that divide that can happen. And I don't think it is a worthwhile divide if you're really trying to get to um, you know, a needs-based framework. Tom, and oh, sorry, sorry, I see Professor Capers coming off. I was just going to say, I mean, for me, narrative is essential. I'm, I'm constantly using narrative in my own work. And it's partially because, uh, you know, we're, we're in, it's hard to imagine how we get to a better world without using narrative to describe what that better world might look like. So I think on the big, in the big scheme of things, grand scheme of things, narrative is essential. Um, but it's who controls the narrative. So we already have propaganda, but it's like who controls the narrative and who can get future narratives out there to imagine a better way. I think I'll just, uh, uh, just add to what Professor Capers just said that who has the mic? Um, I think that really just goes out there. And, but when you, but for, as organizers, of course, for us, it's, it's critical, including for ourselves and the communities that we work with, that it's, it's, a, it's fundamentally that the narrative is informed and guided and echoed uh, collectively through the lived experiences of the community. And when, when, you know, when, when you hear that, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, there's a complete rejection of policing. I'll give you one quick example. I know we're running out of time that the, the, the city of Los Angeles and the police commission in LA commissioned its own survey by LMU, Loyola Marymount University, very well respected university in, in Los Angeles. And the survey about people's sentiment around policing. 
And they released these, uh, the, uh, the, the results of this survey, and this was going back in 2020, uh, in November of that, and they, they, they identified that 67%, 67 point some percent of the community of people who were surveyed clearly said that resources should be taken away from the Los Angeles Police Department and reallocated into how, you know, life enhancing conditions. And 37%, I mean, overwhelmingly, completely called for the abolition of policing. So I think it's, uh, so when we look at this echo chamber, there's a much bigger echo chamber out there that is constantly sick and tired and just wants, you know, just in, in a sense. So how, so, so then the challenge is, how do we make these systems increasingly irrelevant in our lives? What are the alternatives that we are looking towards building power on the ground and then kind of just, you know, and, and, and taking control of that mic? I think uh, I can think of no better way to end the panel than uh, how do we uh, how do we take control of that mic? Uh, thanks, Simon. Um, thank you to the Journal of Law Reform and to all of the panelists. It's great. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, everyone. I think this was a really incredible way to end the week. So I appreciate all of you coming. And thank you to all of our attendees, too. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Thanks for having us. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you.